It, it's not being Machiavellian, the techniques you learn on the police beat booth. You know, there's a very complicated relationship between journalists and politicians and prosecutors and Yakuza. We all, to some extent, are kind of sometimes playing each other, if, especially if one of us has better information than the other. All right, folks. Today, I'm honored to say that I am talking with the fascinating Jake Adelstein. So Jake is originally from Missouri, and when he was 19, he moved over to Japan to finish off his education in Japanese literature. He then became a journalist at the Yomuri Shimbun, Japan's largest newspaper, which is where he was exposed to the dark underbelly of Japanese society. It was here his path crossed with the Yakuza, a criminal organization that boasted over 80,000 members at its peak. In his memoir, Tokyo Vice, Jake chronicles the rollercoaster journey of reporting on some of the most notorious crime lords in the Yakuza. His story can now be watched in the form of the HBO Max show of the same name, which features actors Ensel Elgort and Ken Watanabe, which, by the way, I strongly recommend, and if you haven't seen it, what are you doing? Today, I'm so excited to have Jake here to deep dive into his experiences and views on Japanese society. Jake, welcome. It is so lovely to have you here. It's lovely to be here. Um, about five days before Tokyo Vice airs in the United States, say season two, I have no I idea when it's going to show up in England. I, don't ask me. I don't know. I, don't I was know. going to ask you. Yeah. Before meeting today, I sent a desperate email like last week, like, do we have any idea? Where's, who's going to show this? Is this going to show in England? I, it doesn't show in Japan until April, so... You know, what? the world is a mysterious <laughs> place to me. Pardon me if I slurp my coffee. It's, it's, That's okay. Not, it's common. I always slurp my coffee. <laughs> Go for it. No, I was, I was actually going to ask you that because I know it comes out soon. And I'm, I watched the trailer again for the fifth time yesterday. And I'm just so psyched. I can't wait. Here's, here's an interesting thing. I was just thinking about the UK today because... I have to grab this over here. Yeah. Hold on. No worries. Tim off screen. Sorry, it's a terrible guess. So, interestingly enough, we'll talk about the TV show a little bit. They're showing it in Japan um, on on Wow Wow and Netflix. Finally, originally it was yeah. Wow Wow as the partner, but they didn't subtitle the Japanese. So, if, unless you really speak Japanese very well, it's very hard to decipher what is happening in the series i mean yeah. maybe that's a really interesting way to watch it right like, like i don't understand what's going on like, like there's so much mystery there yeah yeah i got blu-ray version of this right yeah the, the blu-ray has the same problem they don't <laughs> subtitle the japanese so i can't give it to my relatives or my friends who you know it's 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 completely worthless in that sense but yeah that's frustrating to my surprise in the uk you can get a, a copy that has the Japanese subtitle in English and French. Okay, um, nice. Or, God help me, maybe they dubbed it over in English, so the Japanese people are speaking with an English accent. I hope not. <laughs> that would be horrific. <laughs> I also feel like that would take away a lot of the tension because it's, it, just, it just wouldn't work. I don't know. Uh, I, I saw it in France, and they were, you know, and I'm, I'm speaking <laughs> elegant French. In, <laughs> when I guess when I'm supposed to be speaking English in those sections, I don't know. Well, I watched it on BBC iPlayer, so they had English subs. So yeah, it's still in Japanese. Yeah, all in English subs. It was fine. So uh, they don't quite match up, but that's okay. That's, a, that's another problem. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, that's another problem for another day. Should we start there then? Let's talk about the TV show a little bit. I was going to start with your early days first, but given that we're already talking about it, how did the rights for Tokyo Vice come about? Did somebody approach you? Did you kind of talk to a bunch oh. of different people? So the book originally came out in 2009. And yeah. um, even before it came out, there was just, you know, a, a kind of sort of nice pre-publicity because I'd written an article and the Washington Post. And and even though I'm not credited as one of the writers, this uh, series of articles in the LA Times about these four Yakuza, four, getting liver transplants at UCL became kind of a big deal, um, yeah. like a national issue in the United States. Um, so shortly after the book came out, I was contacted by John Lesher, who's one of the executive producers, who has spent some time in Japan and it, you know, is, it knows the country better than a lot of people. So, you know, there were years of development. One time it almost became a movie with Danny Radcliffe playing me, um, but that fell apart because, you know, the, the Japanese company that they decided they were going to partner with had a lot of ties to unsavory elements. Um, oh. And I, and I was like, 
And, and I told them at the time, like, this is a really bad decision. You will be left at the altar. And that's exactly yeah. what happened. Like, pulled out at the last minute and all fell apart. So, but all almost, almost from the beginning, um, JT Rogers, who I went to high school with, we were in driver's ed together, who is the showrunner and a successful yeah. playwright, um, has been handling the treatments. And uh, his play Oslo, which is about the Israel-Palestinian peace talks in Norway, um, yeah. which is kind of a dark comedy, um, won, that, won a Tony in 2017. And then, you know, suddenly he had clout and he knew Watanabe Ken and it just went from there. Before we jump into the book, I just want to talk a little bit about your early beginnings and how you ended up in Japan and into the world of journalism and then as an extension of that, the world of Yakuza. You studied Japanese literature in Japan. What was the pull for you to go and do your further education in Japan from Missouri? Well, I was one of those people, you know, in the days before anime was big. Um, we're talking like yeah. late, you know, 80s, um, who really got into karate. And from karate, I got also into Zen Buddhism. And then I became very interested in Japanese nice. culture. Um, so when I was at the University of Missouri, um, there was a study abroad program. And even though it required two years to be able to go to Missouri, you know, two years of language study, uh, you know, as I was walking across the campus one day, like the, the, oh, sorry, that's going to happen periodically. Let me see if I can turn off. Okay. <laughs> the study in Japan program fire, like literally hit me in the face as I was walking across campus. So I walked over to the international division and I was like I'd like to do this and it's like you cannot do this because you have to have two late years of Japanese language study yeah and you know and I asked them well you know, out of curiosity how many people do we have going from the University of Missouri Columbia to Japan and how many people are coming here and they're like well we have 20 people coming from Sophia University but we have no one going from our school because <laughs> the end is so high and I was like well you know I I'm not an expert on Japanese culture but I can tell you you know, that if they have 20 coming and we're sending no one, that's not an exchange. That's a catastrophe. And that can't yeah. play well with our Japanese partners. So you should yeah. be glad. You should reconsider. And you should go, you should go ask the head of the program whether or not I can go. Yeah. So I go in like 15 minutes later, they're like, okay, you're going. And I'm like, oh, great. So <laughs> off I went to Japan. And uh, as soon as I got there, I liked it a lot. I found, um, I was first just saying what we call a gaijin house, gaijin being the word for foreigners. And, yeah. you know, it's not a great place to learn Japanese because uh, also, you know, they're, they're not particularly nicely run places. You know, you, you have a living room that you yeah. share and you, your kind of closet, which is your bedroom and, yeah. uh, and, you know, in a shared bathroom. It's, and uh, a couple months later, just through a series of coincidences, I ended up um, living in this, this little Zen Buddhist temple in near Ikebukuro, which wow. is not a particularly, you know, it's not a, it's not a, it's not a tourist kind of place, Ikebukuro. I mean, it's all right. Yeah. Um, and, you know, after a couple of years, I was like, oh, I'm going to stay. And, uh, you know, as I was floundering around trying to decide what I was going to do for um, after college, um, I applied and had a job lined up at Sony. And in, in, in Japan, it, it used to be that you would look for jobs before you graduated. Right. And you would get what's called a night day, which is a guarantee, like a sort of under the table contract to go work for a company. Um, so I had, you know, assurance that I had a job. And then, um, but I had a year of school left. And I was like, well, if I don't push myself, I won't achieve much. So I was writing for the school newspaper in Japanese, just as kind of like a, something to see you know can I you know it's one thing to read it it's another thing to write it I want to see like can I can I get the hang yeah. of this um and all my buddies were like preparing for these examinations to join the newspaper a newspaper newspapers in Japan the nationals it's very different from um the United States or Britain is is basically the major newspapers have local offices all throughout the country um and then they have a national edition and then basically they try and get reporters out of college who are malleable, um, then send them to the local areas to work on the local editions and national news editions um, at first. And the hiring is all done through examination. 
So you take an examination either at the, 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 the seminar on the company, which is actually a recruiting device, or you apply during the test period. If you do well in the exams, you get called back for the interviews. If you do well in the interviews, they offer you a job, you know, yeah. job for life. And so you know, with my one year, I spent a lot of time studying for that exam because I was like, you know, and everyone was like, it'll never happen. Like no Japanese newspaper will ever hire a foreigner to report on, you know, Japanese news. And I was like, well, well, you know, maybe, but what's the, you know, what the, the worst is that my Japanese improves and I get a, an assessment yeah. of how Japanese stands with other Japanese college students. Well, let's see, let's see what happens. And so uh, just like in the series, I took the exam and I did well enough that they called me back and you know, 1993, April 15th, I started my first day on the job in the Urawa office in Saitama. That's amazing. That is amazing. So the dream, so there wasn't a dream to become a journalist. It was a um, consequence of you wanting to push yourself to try something maybe new. Yes, I apologize to all serious journalists in the world. I was not, <laughs> it was not, like, I didn't start out like, like young Anza yeah. and the, in the TV show, like, like, I'm going to, correct the world like i'm going to add yeah. the knowledge of the world i was like you know like i like to write i like to meet people i like to interview <laughs> fun wouldn't this be a fun job yeah, <laughs> um, yeah so i'm sorry you know i only developed ideally <laughs> much later in the game i'm curious what was the role that you had at sony lined up um i was going to be some i think they said i was going to be in the uh like the I think the computer, like computer creative division. So I'd be sort of like, okay. I guess I would be working on game scripts and stuff for the okay. PlayStation. You know, that was sort of what they told me was like a writing role, maybe localizing things. It was very, you know, poorly defined, but I was like, I'm like, I'm like, and I wasn't even into computer games at all, or I don't even remember yeah. if there was a PlayStation in 93. I don't know, but you know, it was like, okay, yeah. like I, I've played games on the PC. It's fun. Yeah, you know, uh, you know, Sony is a big company. Sounds good to me. Yeah, yeah. You might have ended up working on the Yakuza video games. <laughs> yeah, that would have been hilarious. But, but I wouldn't have known anything. <laughs> exactly. Known exactly. Anything. So when you when you first arrived in Japan, you know, you're 19 years old. What's what's the biggest culture shock for you? Like, what's the first thing you see and you're like, wow, this is different. <sighs> The very first thing that made me think how this place is very, very different than what you said. I didn't have the proper visa to come into the country in the first place. Okay. Like I, honestly, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't fill out the form. Or I didn't get it stamped right. And uh, you know, everybody has already gone through customs. I'm like the last person there. I'm sort of pulled aside, and they're like, "Why don't you have the student visa?" And I have like I have all the paperwork showing that I've been accepted and I'm going to be staying at Sophia University. And I said, "I'm like I'm terribly sorry. Like you know I." I thought I had everything that I needed. And they were like, you know, so they, they make a couple calls. I don't know who they called. And then yeah. um, they said, okay, please, please write that you made a terrible mistake and that you're very sorry on this, on this paper. And I'm like, I'm a terrible thing. I'm very sorry. Uh, you know, <laughs> like, and I, and I'm like, okay. And they, you know, and they took my apology note and they folded it up and they stamped my visa. And there I was. And I was like, <laughs> huh <laughs> like this isn't how it would work in the united states there would yeah, be like no so two things happened one it was like you know the, the having to apologize thing the realizing okay <laughs> apologizing is very important here right yeah uh, and the other thing was that you know my image of japan is be, be people being so rigid that you know no one ever bent the rules that everything be, had to be done by the book but my experience has been that with bureaucracy, that people are amazingly flexible. Yeah. And sort of was, you know, for me, that was a little bit of a culture shock. This isn't, you know, this isn't like the United States and it's, you know, it's, it's a very different thing. Yeah, it's interesting because I, uh, so I'm a, I'm a big reader of the Japan subreddit. And one of the things that comes up all the time is the slowness of the like admin and the bureaucracy of the country. And I do, like, I think a lot of people find that very confusing because Japan in some ways is so technologically advanced, but then in other ways, it does seem to be quite a slow. I mean, things are slow, right? I mean, yeah. it, to get high speed internet in my house, um, which I, 
you know, I have a, like, I have actually have a house here now. It's been a fixer upper. Um, yeah. But uh, it took months and months and like phone calls and red tape and the, you know, the provider saying, well, you're, and I'm like, what is taking so long? They're like, well, you know, to put high speed fiber optic cables into your house, we have to use a phone pole that is in somebody else's property and we're negotiating with them. And I'm like, I think I'm your company. Like, you can't just do it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <Ask for permission. laughs> um, but, but, you know, when you've lived here a very long time, you realize that the bureaucracy and the, you know, can be very flexible. Surprisingly, you know, that there's a, a certain yeah. amount of bandwidth that they're given. And, you know, that's why I'm like, okay, if you have to deal with the Japanese bureaucracy, it's like, shave, you know, like get a haircut, put on your suit, go down there and be polite. You will, you will get so much farther than if you show up in a t-shirt and jeans yeah. you know, with tattoos visibly displayed and, and expect them to treat you with, you know, warm and open. <laughs> it honestly sounds like the UK. I think, I think there's some parallels between Japan and the UK. You know, there's, what's the word? Shimag, um, shimagun, shimaguni konjo? Like the, 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 the psychology of an island people. So, you know, Japan and right. England are both islands, right? So there's definitely, yeah. I feel that. Yeah, definitely. So you, you talked about at the start about how obviously coming into Japan, you're a gaijin, a foreigner. And for you, like you've been there for how many years now in Japan? You've been living there for how many years? Since 1988. Um, okay. So that's like 35 years or something. Yeah, 35 years. One of the kind of most common things that I see when I speak to foreigners who've spent, you know, a couple of years in Japan is, is that they never truly feel accepted into Japanese society because it's so homogenous. You know, you've been there for 30 plus years now. Do you feel Japanese? Do you feel a part of Japanese society? Well, I mean, here, here's my, my counter to that question or other people complain yeah. about it. Is there any place in the world where you can just walk in and automatically be accepted, whether it's, a, you know, sure. Branson, Missouri or Brixton, you know, can you just walk in there and people are yeah, going to greet you? Yeah. Um, yeah. If you live in a community long enough in your area and you get to know your neighbors, after a while they forget that you're a foreigner, you're accepted. Yeah. You're not accepted yeah. everywhere, but you're accepted within the community of people that you know you. And I think that that's the best we could expect. I don't think, you know, there's anywhere in the world where everywhere you go, they welcome you with with open arms. I don't think if someone from Bavaria can come to Berlin and they're like, oh, brother, yeah, let me, you know, be my friend. <laughs> <laughs> that's so true i also think I, I i get that sentiment quite a lot because i have quite a few american friends who've spent some time in japan and i think obviously american culture is very different in the sense that you know you can go to new york you'll see you'll see people of from everywhere every type of person right it's it's pretty incredible but i think taking that expectation to then tokyo which is obviously one of the biggest cities in the world is maybe a it's a it's a mismatch right because it's such a different culture, such a different society. I mean, and it's a language issue too, a lot of times. I mean, if you speak Japanese, just like a Japanese person, you know, yeah. it's it's easy for them to forget that you're a foreigner, right? You're just another person, right? Yeah. But if, you, if you're not able to speak the language well, then there's always, gonna, every you know, every time you open your mouth, you're kind of reminding them like, oh, I am not, you know, I'm not yeah. Japanese. You may not yeah. be understanding what I am saying, or I, yeah. I may not be understanding what you're saying. So exactly, fluency in language helps a lot, but um, yeah. you know, I mean, you know, also you just have to understand that you know that a lot of the xenophobia in Japan are the things that people get offended. It isn't malicious; it's just ignorant. So yeah, you know, you 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 know, you may you may be friends with somebody for uh, you know like 10, 20 years, and someday they suddenly say, "Oh, I forget that you're a foreigner." Don't be offended. They're just sort of talking out loud to themselves, right? You know, it's like <laughs> yeah, that's so true. Like, and, and, and you know, and you know, every now and then, like I'm, I'm like, I, I'm, you know, someone's on their iPhone or something, and I'm trying to get something done, and I'm like, and, and they look up and they have this sort of look, like, oh, like, oh, the dog can speak. <laughs> like, oh, oh what a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't know the dog could speak <laughs> and, um, so you know, and it's like well what do you, what do you, you know it's just like that's just how it is like it's fine 
yeah you just kind of accept it I think if you know that going into it then you're not going to be so shocked by it I think just be open to it now there was a recent lawsuit against the Japanese government for, for against the police for racial profiling it's true interesting and, okay and it is the darker you are the more you get harassed by the police it's absolutely yeah. correlation right I yeah. mean there's such a correlation that you know or do you look Middle Eastern or whatever it's such a correlation like when I when I go back to Japan I shave on the plane so I'm like clean shave lather on the sunscreen so I don't get any darker so I'm not mistaken for <laughs> Indonesian or an Asian or an Indian or a Bangladeshi not because because uh, I approve of Japanese racism because I just don't want to deal with the hassle yeah exactly that's totally fair that's a good tip actually I'll tell my brother when we're planning to go to Japan next year to shave off his beard <laughs> yes, yes yes shave off his beard Wear, wear at least like a polo or, you know, okay. a dress shirt. You'll sail through. Okay, got it. Well, I have one more question just kind of on your early beginnings and then we'll start deep diving into the book and the world of the Yakuza. Let's talk about the Yumeri a little bit. So obviously you're, you're the only foreigner there at that point and completely new experience. I mean, how old were you when you joined the Yumeri? So you must have been like 20, 21 at that no, point? No, no, I, 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 okay. I spent an extra year in college because I... Okay. And, uh, you know, because not all my, not all my credits transferred. So I think I was Got about it. 24 when I started. 24. Okay, perfect. So you're still, you're, you're, you're early to kind of mid twenties. You go through that in crazy intense exam process, <laughs> which I have to say, that was probably one of my favorite scenes in the TV show. I just, I love that scene so much. Like your first day you turn up, what is, what is that atmosphere like for you? Are people staring at you? Are people wondering who is this random guy in this office? Like, why is he here? I mean, everybody, had, everyone had been briefed and we'd also sort of had a pre-entrance okay. meeting. So, you know, everybody was okay. The, the okay. problem was when I went to the Omiya police station is that, you know, some police jumped to the conclusion that I was like a Iranian that had escaped from the, you know, from the holding cell. <laughs> And, and, and like I'm almost like almost like slammed me against the wall, and then uh, oh my god! And, and, and the you know the vice captain of the place was like, "What is this? You know, what, what is this guy doing here?" And I was like, "Ah, uh, I'm like I work for the Omidy, <laughs> not an escapee." Um, and, and they were like, "Oh!" And then you know it was interesting, and and uh, you know Araisan, who was the vice chairman of the uh, of the Omia police station, there would be a photo of him. He was also like a rabid right-wing nationalist i never really met one of those before so yeah. he was you know to be, you know like like insulting words that the japanese used towards the occupying forces like and, and i was like okay um, <laughs> like, all right i mean i guess this is this is you know this is different here's uh here's some actual hostility towards uh, you know uh, americans and i'm like but it's yeah. refreshing i feel like it should be there and i should have seen more of it but yeah no it was always you know so but for the first year this happened over and over that became like a running joke i'd knock on the door you know of a crime scene and be like you midi this and they'd be like we don't need that we don't need the omidy or like we already subscribe and i'm like you know i'm, I'm not here to sell you a newspaper the paper, I, yeah. i'm a reporter for the paper and when this weekly magazine wrote an article about me like foreigner working for Japanese newspaper, um, you know, I, I copied it and I'd carry a copy around and then I would show it to people like, see, this is me. Like, you know, I know it's yeah. unusual. And then, yeah. you know, then it would take like, you know, 30 seconds, you know, 30 seconds of needless conversation, but then, you know, they're like, oh, okay. All right. You know, like, okay. So you're, you're, you're a reporter and you're a foreigner. Okay. You know, and then people would either talk to me or they wouldn't. Most of the time, they were interested enough that was like actually, yeah, uh, that's interesting. They'd ask you a couple of questions, and I'd be like, you know, can I ask you, like, have you seen anything suspicious in this neighborhood in the last week? You know, yeah, you know, like, notice anybody like, you know, walking, you know, walking around this house late at night, that kind of stuff. Interesting. What was your favorite part of being a reporter? Was it that, you know, walking around trying to figure out like what was happening? Was it the actual writing of what you'd found? What was, yeah, what was the thing that you enjoyed the most? For me, the, then when you'd be working on a case and it wasn't clear who was responsible or who was the guilty party or how it had been done, that that moment when everything clicked, you're like, oh, this is why this happened. This is the person responsible. This is how it was done. This is the yeah. motive. When you understood everything about it, 
um, and the whole puzzle came together and everything made sense. Yeah. That moment of like, like solving a, um, you know, a murder mystery, you know, like uh, yeah. the epiphany. that was always the most exciting part. Like, oh, this is how they disguise the operation. This is, this is where the money went. Yeah. That was always the part I really liked, the sort of the problem solving epiphany. Um, and it's even harder because like, you, you know, if you read a, a mystery novel and it's written fairly, right? Yeah. Um, you know, the, all the clues are there. But you, you know, you're not the police, so you don't have all the clues. So it's a little harder to reach that point of like, I know what happened. This yeah. is how it was, why it was done. But I, I really enjoyed that part too. The, the, the piecing together of things I enjoyed a lot. The solving yeah. the puzzle. Yeah. Uh, and the second thing I actually really liked. I mean, I like the writing. Um, uh, is the wheeling and dealing. You know, t- because yeah. you're, you know, t- the collecting of the information, which sometimes involves going to real estate deeds sometimes it involves like you know pitting you know can you know getting one cop who's not in on that investigation to talk about the investigation because it's no skin yeah. off of their back or sometimes it would be like you'd be talking to some you know you're looking for a story to work on and you're talking to some right yakuza you know yakuza goon about you know you know what the other organization in the you know in the town or the prefecture is doing and they you know and they give you a hint so you could sort of play them off each other because you also realize that's what the police yeah. were doing too. so you you learn yeah. from each various factions like how do i collect the information that gives me enough of an edge that i can write a story before somebody else does yeah you're essentially playing a game of people <laughs> it's essentially game what of you're doing. In, in actual <laughs> actual fact gathering yeah. information yeah, of course, of course. Do you remember the first interaction that you had with a Yakuza member? Like, do you remember the first time where you were like, um, this is a this is a member of a very big, important part of... Yakuza? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, yeah. I mean, they could be. Like, I, I would also like to clarify that unlike the TV series, like, I wasn't like a, a Yakuza, like, I wasn't fascinated yeah. with collecting Yakuza fanzines. It was like... <laughs> yeah. First year on the job, we did a, a an extraordinarily weird uh, story about a husband and wife serial killers, and one of their victims was a yakuza boss who had been blackmailing them. Oh, okay. And then in uh, second year, I got assigned. Like you know, like everybody on the police beat gets assigned a section. So I got I got theft, I got public security, I got organized crime. So Not I sure. you, so yakuza can. Yeah, I got because of countermeasures section one, section two. Um, so Kaneko Naoya, um, who has passed away, was a boss in the Suni, Sumi Oshikai. Um, the, he had this name Neko-chan, which is part of coming from Kaneko, because he was kind of cat-like, like a Cheshire cat. <laughs> um, and he had his office in the red light district of Omiya. Okay. And he called the he called the station. I mean, the, the yeah, what do you call it? The branch office. I, I'm a station is a bad translation of Shikyoku. Um, okay. He called the branch office and was like, you know, I, I want to speak to Jake Edelstein. And he, you know, left a message and identified himself. And I think one of my colleagues, uh, Yoshida Kun, who, who passed away last year, um, yeah. he said, like, he's like, hey, like, one of the, this boss from Sumiyoshi guy wants to talk to you. Are you in trouble? And I'm like, not that I know of. <laughs> Not that I know of. But actually, actually, I could think of a couple of reasons why I might be in trouble. But we won't yeah. go into that. Um, so you know, uh, I, you know. So I, I called him. I, I, I talked to Sekiguchi San, who was a detective on the organized crime force, who was, you know, who who I really respected and become kind of a mentor. Yeah. And as you know, again, this is like the Yakuza boss has called me. Have you ever heard of him? What should I do? And he's like, oh. Like you know, oh, Conico sound like he's a he's a good guy, you know. Like, uh, and like I busted him last year. He had this. He set up this fake political group, shaking out people for donations, and you know, he confessed immediately. Didn't give me any, you know, like a real man. He took, you know, he you know he did the crime. He he did the time. You know, yeah. Like a, one, of, one of the old guys, you know, one of the old guard. And he's like, he's like, if he wants to talk to you, you should you should go talk to him. Like you get any trouble, you just mention my name. He knows who I am. It's like, okay, you know, where is your office located? Can I have an address? And he's like, yeah, just ask anybody in Nanjing. They'll they'll know where I am. Just tell me you're looking for a kind of goal, you know? And all right. And it was like, I'm like, so I got off, you know, at around the meeting time, I went to the south exit of Omiya station and, 
you know, I'm, I don't even know who to ask. So I ask one of these, you know, one of these sex club guys on the you know street who's in a nice little like bolo tie. I mean, they kind of wore, yeah. they used to wear like, bolo ties and black pants and white shirts. And I don't know where the bolo <laughs> guy thing came from. Like, is it just the Wild West? Yeah. Um, and, he, and as they look like oh Kaneko-san he's like oh oh you know he's, he's over there and he's like and he's like do you need anything and your friend Kaneko-san is like well you know he wants to talk to me I can't see we're friends yeah. he's like you need anything and he's like and I'm like I thought you didn't let foreigners into these places <laughs> like your friend Kaneko-san is on the house and I'm like no I just got past like, places to be <gasps> so you know I got to his office and you know knocked on it and you know outcomes like you know the yakuza from central casting you know you can see his tats and yeah you know he's you know his eyes look really red and he's you know in a yeah. in a suit and just looks rough you know yeah scary face and uh i said who i was and it looked like you know and it had like something something construction on the outside of the office and, and kind of goes in like, who is it? And he's like, that's some, you know, it's some guy, Gene, who says he's a reporter. And he's like, like, you know, like, what am I, you dumb fuck? Like, what am I? <laughs> and, you know, he sits, you know, I sit down and he offers me a cup of tea and I said, no, thank you. And then that's just, that immediately we're off to a bad start because he's really upset. He's like, why wouldn't you drink my tea? And I'm, like, oh my I'm God. sorry, I just, don't, I just don't like green tea. And he's like, oh, and he's, like, he's like, oh, you're a foreigner. He's like, well, would you like it? Like, I like some coffee. And he's like, like hot or cold i'm like hot and he's like oh. <laughs> and he's like and he's like and he's like he calls me and I was like go get him some coffee you know we sit down and we have this very you know cordial conversation and he's very smooth talking and you know i remember he was you know he he wasn't completely bald you could see as he had a receding hairline and he kind of had you know gray hair and he's well dressed yeah. i, I I think he had kind of a, you know, a nice jacket, nicely dressed. And you could just barely see the tattoos sort of poking out of the poking suit. Out. Yeah. And uh, just like in the book, um, I think there's a chapter, that chapter is actually online somewhere. He was like, yeah. you know, bury me, bury me in a shallow grave. He's like, you know, I have this problem with this item of police and I was hoping you could clarify it for me. So we had this very, you know, long discussion about what his problem was and you know he told me things that just you know i mean i'm sort of sitting there my head is whirling like the fact that police officers would regularly come by his office and sit with him and have a cup of tea and chat with him i had no idea the relationships were so cordial right but that's how it was in the 90s that's one of the things i was so shocked about in your book your most recent the one that's about to come out uh the last yakuza is how normalized it was for police to just like they would conduct raids but they would tell the yakuza that they were going to raid in advance and it's just like well that kind of defeats the point of doing a raid right <laughs> <laughs> the raid was just for show it's like we're doing yeah. our job it's like it's like yeah. it's like you know a lot of times it would like be like okay you know you know cough up somebody like you know you, you know the balance has been the balance has been disturbed we need you to cough up someone we're gonna you know uh and we're gonna come by to show that we're doing our job and, you know we take out some boxes and they're like okay fine you know like let's let's keep up this yeah. pretense that we haven't already reached an arrangement on this yeah. that's why I think in episode one one of my favorite things in the tv show that is really drawn from the book is you know uh our our is drawn from source material in the book is that you know they go to this office you know everybody's on the bus they're all in their riot gear you're expecting you know this huge confrontation they get in the elevator and the music plays and they walk in yeah shades business cards and it's like okay who are you gonna cough up like you know somebody has to <laughs> it's like this is a bad one we're gonna need to of you guys <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. It's wild how like normalized them I, I mean, being a part of society is. Th there are things that as a reporter you get so used to that you don't yeah. even realize it's a problem because yeah. you know about it. If I know about it, how can it be a problem? So um, Japan has very strict gun laws, right? Extremely yeah. strict. Um, and you know you have a entire division's job is to police guns and drugs. You know, so the number of guns they can seize in a year is, you know, a huge uh, factor in justifying their own existence. So 
for a long time, there was this kind of quiet agreement that, you know, the Yakuza would cough up a couple of guns. Yeah. And when they cough up a gun, you know, the, you know, the, the phrase that they use was kubinashi kenju or kubinashi dogu, which is like basically a headless gun, meaning that there's no one attached to the gun, right? No one gets arrested along with the gun. The gun just right. shows up in a, you know, in a raid yeah. or in a parking lot or in a coin locker. And, you know, and eventually somebody wrote up the fact that, you know, the, the cops were making deals with the Yakuza and the Yakuza were providing them with the guns. And, you know, they're claiming it as, you know, a, a, a gun seizure when in fact it had been voluntarily offered up as kind of a, you know, live and let live thing. Yeah. And, and you know, and, and when, it, when somebody wrote it up as a big story, it was probably like a freshman journalist who had no idea that this was unacceptable. <laughs> Um, we, we, we were all like, oops. <laughs> like, the, right down, I was like, oh, that's, is that bad? Is that not acceptable? If that makes sense. Like, when you're so ingrained in it, your, I guess, your, what's the word that I'm looking for? Your kind of barrier to like what is not right, I guess, increases. Your lines, yeah. like, I guess, you're like your lines, the lines of like morality and like what's right and what's wrong gets very blurred as well but, but there's, you know you fall into this terrible mystique is, which is which is like because i know about it it can't be news because yeah. i know about it and everybody knows about it so <laughs> everybody knows right yeah, I mean, so. to, to, to some extent it was like with uh with you know johnny kitagawa who was sexually molesting the young idols under his care for years and which the bbc yeah you know uh did a documentary on it i, I know the people who are doing documentary we ever you know it was like we all knew about it like everybody knew about yeah. it, you know? yeah. especially in the media, but it was like, uh, you know, it was like just never brought up as an issue. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I we all know. That's, that's also not unique to Japan. So one, one person that is central to the, your, your first book, Tokyo Vice, and then obviously the show is a man who, go, who goes by the name of Tadamasa Goto. Now, from what I understand, he's still, he's still alive. He's still around. He's still He's a little a functioning... senile. He's, still he's, a, senile. he's senile. Okay. <laughs> a, little, a little, a little senile. Just a um, little. Okay. He's still on the United States blacklist as a gangster. Okay. He is like our better fiefdom in Cambodia. Um, okay. You know, I, I'm, I'm required to say that the the character of the Yakuza boss in Tokyo Vice and Goto Tadamas have absolutely no connection. No, nothing so, to do with each other. Got it. Okay. So for people who don't know, Tadamasa Goto is kind of one of the, he's known as being one of the kind of biggest crime lords in Japan at the kind of peak of the Yakuza, right? Um, yes, yes. So he, he led a Yakuza affiliate called the Goto Gumi, which was a branch of the Yamaguchi Gumi, right? So... Right. You, men you mentioned the Sumi Yoshikai. There were kind of three main Yakuza branches. One was the Yamaguchi. Yeah, yeah you go for the it. Yamaguchi, Inagawa yeah. Kai. Inagawa Kai. In the TV series, I will I will say this because it's not a secret. And it's also yeah. a lot of the last Yakuza available at bookstores in, in, in England now, I believe. Finally. Yeah, um, definitely. Yeah. Inagawa Kai is, you know, the group I wrote about the most in the last Yakuza. But they are also kind yeah. of the model for the Jihara Kai. Okay. I was going to ask you about that. Yeah. You know, in a sense that if you're talking about old school Yakuza, the yeah. Inigawa Kai was the closest to, you know, the founder was very much like, okay, we're not going to bother ordinary people. We're not going to engage in trafficking and drugs. You know, we're going to have some rules, you know, no involvement in theft, yeah. no involvement in robbery, no sexual assault, no dealing drugs. Yeah. We collect our protection money. We, you know, organize gambling, maybe a little loan sharking, you know, but we don't yeah. try and be a bother to the general community. Now, of course, when an organization gets big enough, all those things fall apart. But um, yeah. there was a sense of we need to live in harmony with Japanese society and be a beneficial force. And when the first organized crime laws went on the books, the Yamaguchi Gumi fought it in court in 1992. But the head of the Inagawa Kai, Inagawa Seijo, <laughs> said, you know, if we are... If the if the if the government is creating these laws to keep us in order, then it's because we've been behaving badly, and thus we deserve right. to fight it. Yeah. Um. So what, 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 we're getting back on the conversation. So, anyway, the Yamaguchi Gumi has probably been the most corporate of all the Yakuza groups. At one time, they had forty thousand yeah. members. Uh, founded in nineteen fifteen, you know, a very efficient organization, and in terms of like. 
creating big businesses and um you know huge business deals and really shady uh immoral operations that probably would have you know that 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 other yakuza would have refrained from Gotogumi was notorious for doing it. I mean, they menaced civilians. Uh, you know, they brutally evicted people from places. There was no, yeah. you know, they were a bother to the ordinary citizen and they yeah. didn't have any compunction about using violence. Um, yeah. And Goto himself became very wealthy because he was a smart businessman. I mean, he came from a family of businessmen. Um, at one time, he was the largest shareholder of Japan Airlines. So yeah. I like to I like to compare him to a homicidal Richard Branson. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> what was the first time that you, do you remember the first time that you came across his name or like you came across him as a person and his work and what he was doing? Um, you know, I, I met him once in a club in Osaka in like 99 and that was just a fluke. Okay. Um, was, and he was, and even then, I guess he was like an arrogant prick. I was like, oh, this guy is really arrogant. Um, <laughs> I, I, you know, I think we might have had like, like a, a very short little conversation, like, oh, you know, like, you know, like, kind of like in the series, but it was very short. Um, oh. and, and, you know, um, but I think when we were working on the Empire of, uh, I think that we were working on the Kajiyama Susumu case, which was this, uh, Yakuza with the Goryo Kai who had set up a, a, a giant network of loan sharking operations that looked yeah. legitimate. They were yeah. really squeezing money out of people in, you know, in, you know, every way possible yeah. um, that his name came up. And uh, even though he wasn't centrally involved, you know, I started hearing about him and I was like, wow, you know, this guy's a bad dude. I mean, of course, yeah. when you're on the organized crime task force, you know, he, I mean, I already knew who he was from the day I started because his yeah. men had attacked Tommy Juzo, this film director who'd made Mean Bon Ona, a really dark comedy about the Yakuza in which he portrayed them as terrible people um, who preyed on the weak in Japan and were a combination of fraudsters and, you know, homicidal goofs. Um, and not a very yeah. flattering. So I, I knew who he was. Um, and I was working on the Kajiyama Susumu case. I also realized that... Um, you know, that uh, he was a force to be reckoned with. And, and a lot of, a lot of the stuff in Tokyo involved his organization because, you know, he had money and power I and mean, he had like a, a thousand people working for him in, um, Absolutely, yeah. in the greater Tokyo area. And, and if you yeah. include the people in Shizuoka, where it's actually had his headquarters more. Um, so, yeah. you know, you could, you know, in, in many ways, the most recognizable of the Yakuza and also probably one of the most vicious. I mean, everybody feared him. Yeah. And, you know, you know, you, you would know, you know, after a while you're working on things and you realize, oh, this production company, this talent agency, it's owned by, you know, yeah, that's his turf, that's his people. Let's say you're like an actor who's coming up in the world of entertainment. Do you think the average person knew that, he was involved in that agency that maybe they had just signed with or do you think people were ignorant to it i think a lot of people knew i think you know i think yeah. many people knew that the, that the agency he was involved with and the agency he ran um that yeah. he was in, in the back i don't think many people yeah. got them um one of the things of course that ended up causing his you know his downfall my article sort of got the ball rolling but he had this huge birthday yeah. party in which a bunch of you know a-list and b-list japanese celebrities showed up um, when he was supposed to be, this is like 2008, when he was supposed to be, you know, too sick to attend a meeting of the Yamaguchi Gumi headquarters. And that celebrity party brought a lot of attention to him that was kind of uh, not wanted because, yeah. you know, all the famous entertainers who showed up at that party were then, you know, forbidden to, you know, to do the Kohaku uh, event on NHK at the end of the year. And it, it really highlighted the, the, the close connections between Yakuza and actors in the entertainment world. Yeah. Um, so I think everybody knew. Yeah. I, I, think, I think at the point when Burning Productions, oh, there I said it. Okay, Burning Productions, which is listed in the Tokyo yeah. Metropolitan Police 
uh, files as a client company of the Gotogumi, at least since 2007. Um, they allegedly used to be close to the Inagawa Kai, but you know, suddenly they became under the Yamaguchi Gumi Gotogumi at one point, and they were a very powerful production company. I'm sure that yeah. they've cleaned up their act and no longer have any Yakuza ties, but at the time, they certainly were recognized as such. Um, yeah. And, you know, at a critical point, somebody fired a couple gunshots into their offices, which tells you like, okay, the transition from one organized crime group to another didn't go so well. Yeah, now, that happens. Um, I have a, you know, a nice scoop in 2015, in which I obtained a photo of the vice chairman of Japan's Olympic Committee, um, Mr. Tanaka, who was also the chairman of the board of Nihon University, um, yeah. with the uh, head of the Yamaguchi Gumi, right? So, you know, got the, the wow. you know, yeah. the vice chairman of Japan's Olympic Committee, right? With the number one mafiosa in the country together <laughs> in a photo. It's not that old. Um, and that was a great scoop for me. But, you know, the reason yeah. I got that was because there are other photos of, you know, Mr. Tanaka um, with the head of the Sumio Shikai. And when he switched from the Sumio Shikai to the Yamaguchi Gumi, <laughs> Sumio Shikai wasn't very amused. And, you know, uh, once I knew of the photo's existence, it wasn't hard to find someone who could like, like, you know, you know, please do with what you will with this photo. And yeah. I was, and this is the thing that's really hard to, when you're dealing with the Yakuza as a reporter. And when I yeah. say the Yakuza, you know, we, you and I understand, uh, who everybody who's listening to this understands, we're not talking about one monolithic organization like yeah. what you see bad TV is like, oh, the Yakuza are going to get you. Like, which Yakuza? You know, <laughs> which is the 21? There's so many. <laughs> you know, even the Yamaguchi Gumi is fragmented. The, like many right. factions are 40,000 people, but it's not one organization. It's like, yeah, the Yamaguchi Gumi has got the Kodokai. It's the Yamaken Gumi. It's the, yeah. you know, Chinrengo. There's like lots of subdivisions there. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, that, that, uh, the thing is, you know, Yakuza have great information because they blackmail people. Extortion is a wonderful yeah. tool. I mean, yeah. it, you know, if you're collecting, you know, fifty dollars from every hooker on this on the streets, you know, it's you know, sort of rental money for being in in your turf. Well, that's yeah. okay, that's good money. But if you, um, you know, are able to lure a, you know, NEC vice president into an illicit affair with a young man or a young woman. And you know yeah. about that, you blackmail them and and say like, okay, we want you to invest $50 million into this company of ours. Well, yeah. that's a big call, right? Exactly, yeah. It's also so, like, because I, I remember, I think it was in Tokyo Vice, your first book, you talk about Kabukicho, which is the red light district or the biggest red light district in Japan and probably one of the biggest in the world. And that was at that, you know, kind of in the 90s. I don't know about now, maybe you can clarify, but that was the kind of hub for the Yakuza, yeah. right? And, you know, they owned kind of hostess clubs, massage parlors, all, all the things that you can possibly think of. Um, so, you know, you, ha you have a CEO of a big, you know, Japanese company go in there. That's evidence enough that, you know, they can use yeah. against that person, right? Like, it's... If, they're, if they're not being careful, right? You know, there's the, the yeah. whole proprietor. I mean, so, you know, the real money is to be made in Ginza. With, yeah. the, with the high end clubs, you know, yeah, we could kind of for, for kind of for low lives, but still, you know, people yeah. go slumming here sometimes. Yeah. Um. Oh, the point I wanted to make is with, with the, uh, the thing is, you know, as a reporter, what has been interesting once I realized, like, okay, you know, I think it was my first. We're, we're going back to the first talk I had with the Yakuza boss ever. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I vividly remember. So you know, me and we here sitting at this table. We got this like crystal ashtray in front of us. Um, I mean, I think I'm trying to smoke mild sevens, but I'm not doing a very good job because I don't smoke cigarettes very much, <laughs> but um, trying not to cough. Um, yeah. And he's kind of like at one point is like, we're getting along. We got along. He's kind of like, you know, like, you and I, like, we're in the same business. And I'm like, you make your money and your reputation by finding out things that people don't want written up and writing them. And we make our money yeah. by finding out the same things and making sure people like you don't do your job for which we get paid. And I was like, I was like, no, no, we're very different. But I was also thinking, yeah. oh, there is a similarity there, right? We're both in the information industry. What we want to do with that information and why we want that information is, yeah. is very different. But there's also some other motives there as well. Yeah. Because of course, I can't so the thing is, you know, whenever a Yakuza provides you information, 
Um, so you have to clarify with them so that you don't get you don't get into trouble later. It's like, you know, you are not doing me a favor. I am doing you a favor because even though I don't know what your motives are and I would like to, you're not giving me this information out of the goodness of your heart. You're giving them six, you get something out of it. So exactly. I don't know you, you owe me. Yeah. Let's clarify. If you're, if you feel like I'm going to owe you something because I'm going to write this up, then, you know, then let's just call it. Then, then thank you. I have no interest in that. You have after to clarify. You, yeah. Like after you spoke, after that conversation, that meeting that you had with Kaneko, like, did you think to yourself, like, oh shit, like I've just been talking to a Yakuza. Was there a moment of realization or did you just kind of go along with the flow? <laughs> no, no, I was, like, I was like, wow, that was scary. <laughs> I was like, like, you know, like, cause, cause you know, his goons would sort of peek in it every now and then. And like, they were scary. <laughs> you know, like, and I was like, and I, like, you know, sweat dripping down my shirt. And I was like, 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 wow, that was scary. And I, and then, you know, I, I was like, I'm going to call, you know, I'm, I need to go see Sekutsan and see what he says because I have no idea to do what this information is, you know, so yeah. I explain the situation to him. Yeah. Um, but, you know, that it, it, it is an, an interesting thing. And, you know, you, I wouldn't, it, it's not being Machiavellian, the techniques you learn on the police people. You know, there's a very complicated relationship between journalists and politicians and prosecutors and Yakuza. Um, yeah. as, you know, we're all, we all to some extent are kind of sometimes playing each other, if, especially if one of us has better information than the other. Um, yeah. So, you know, you, you sometimes you, you, you have to know who's, who's, who's on whose side. So for example, like the Saitama Organized Crime Control Division was divided into four divisions, North, South, East, and West. Not very great naming, but that's what they were. Her. Yeah. And, you know, if you ask someone in North Division, what are you working on? They wouldn't tell you, right? Because, you know, you yeah. they don't want to, they don't want to blow the story. They don't want to get in trouble for telling you about something that's still in the works. But, you know, if you ask them, what, what are those guys in the South doing? They haven't done a good case in years. And like, they'd be like, oh, no, actually, they got this really great case, you know, involving, yeah. you know, involving like a illegal dumping of, you know, medical waste by one of their front companies. And I'm like, oh, that's fascinating. Yeah. Same, with, same with the Ox, you know, you, um, and what was lucky for me uh, is that, you know, Goto Gumi and Goto himself was such a tyrant. He was such a yeah. uh, bully and a sociopath that even within his own organization, people hated him. And within yeah. the Amaguchi Gumi, you know, there was another faction that wanted his turf and territory. And he realized like, you know, at one point when I needed, I realized I'm going to need an ally in, in dealing with these people that I realized, okay, yeah. this, we have a common interest, which is, so that's the, the whole yeah. principle of this what the enemy of my enemy is my friend yeah what do you think i mean you've been kind of close to this world and to an extent close to goto as well like what do you think motivates what do you think motivated a guy like him to do the things that he did i mean was it money power wealth was is he just evil i would say he's an evil person I'd say that okay. he enjoys the suffering of others. I think he he, wow. he he really gets off on winning, on humiliating people, um, yeah, and and gaming people. So he's ruthless. Um, you know, he is he is smart enough to know that you need to reward people for loyalty, right? Um, um but he's also very good at, uh, you know, and, and like all sociopaths, he's charming. Yeah. But he's also very good at creating an atmosphere of fear and distrust to keep people on edge. So, for example, if someone in the Gotogumi screwed up, um, you know, let's say, you know, uh, he would have your best friend in the organization beat the shit out of you. <sighs> yeah. Which really makes you feel alienated and isolated. Yeah. Um, but is also very effective. Because now you don't, you can't really trust anyone, and in the same sense, you can't trust anyone. You're afraid to go out of the organization. And then he would also make sure that if he, you know, if he didn't kill you, that he had you beaten up and humiliated in front of your family or close ones, so that they would be so terrified that they would urge you not to go to the police. Yeah. So his weapon was fear, basically. He was yeah. preying on people's fear. Yeah. And that wasn't. So let's look at like the Inagawa Kai. It seems like they had, I mean, you mentioned at the start that they had like rules, they had like an honor code, I guess, that they lived by. It seems that he just, 
he didn't even have that. It doesn't seem like there were any rules. It just whatever he wanted. Like, why do you think people went along with it? Is it because they got the financial upside as well? Or was there something else? The financial upside was great. If you did exactly what he wanted um, and, you know, obeyed obeyed his command, then you were were rewarded lavishly. You were promoted. You know, just like, you know, sort of keep people in a, you know, a conflict habituated relationship. If you alternate punishment and reward, you can kind of trap someone into that relation, you know, into this relationship that you can't get out of. Yeah. Um, and I think he understood that well. I, I mean, he's psychologically brilliant in manipulating people and, and very adept at, you know, um, you know, he, 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 there were magazines in his pocket. Um, that would you know that he would he could use to destroy his own enemy socially if he didn't need to, he didn't need it physically he could you know just humiliate you or destroy your career through a couple well placed articles if you crossed him um, and of course now uh, you know one of the reasons Tokyo Vice has never been published in print form in Japan is that I discussed very early on that he was doing the dirty work for Sokogakai which is a religious organization okay. so. Um, which with, with a political party and right. uh, people who criticize the organization. Um, you know, at one point he was extorting, he was extorting money from them, threatening them. And then he later became their go-to guy for shutting up criticisms or shutting up critics. Yeah. Um, you know, when you have a, a large religious organization, which like, you know, which is still incredibly powerful in Japan, you know, working with you and for you, you're a very powerful person. You, yeah, you can reach, definitely. you know, places and politicians that no other thug could touch. If you were a member of the Gotogumi and, you know, let's say, obviously I'm very much hypothetical, but I'm sure it happened. The situation that you said, you're, you do something stupid and then you have to beat up your friend, your work colleague, essentially. Did people try to defect from the Gotogumi and maybe go to other Yakuza branches or was that just an absolute no-no? No, because if you defected, he would hunt you down and kill you. He'd kill you, case. yeah. Okay. Um, there was a murder case that the police tried to pin on him for years and years. Um, and it was a murder of a real estate agent named Nozaki who was interfering with his plans to develop uh, a very valuable building in the Shibuya area ward, which is confusingly called the Shinjuku building. And Nozaki-san was stabbed to death in the streets and the police investigated it for years and years. Um, But the key person, the one person who could have said, yeah, I got direct orders, was hiding out in Thailand and then was machine gunned to death. Um, And, uh, you know, the police arrested someone and then that the you know the Thai guy who was supposedly committed the crime was let go because it was clear that he hadn't actually committed the crime that he'd been paid to be the dummy and everybody's pretty sure that Goto had the guy killed so couldn't be pinned on him which is at that point in time um and this is I, I write about this in my forthcoming book Tokyo Noir which will be coming out in July in England amazing I mean, I books book after book coming out this year uh he Goto got sued by the family of the man who was killed and um, eventually had to pay a $1.2 million settlement and apologize okay. to the family. He never, he was never prosecuted for the actual murder. That's, that is insane to me. It's also insane to me. Like he obviously had very broad reach. I mean, Yakuza based in Japan, but it sounds like, and later on, we'll talk about the case that you kind of revealed, which is, is that he was getting a, a transplant, a liver transplant, I think it was. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, in the US because he had uh, issues with his liver. So he had like reach in the US, in Thailand, like how, how broad was his network? To my knowledge, he had, he had front companies in the United States, yeah, uh, Germany, uh, maybe something in Taiwan. Okay. Um, you know, very powerful within Japan, some good connections yeah. in the United States. Um, yeah. uh, a company in Germany, and I'm never really quite sure what the company did, import and export. Okay. Um, but, yeah, and, but definitely had reach. Um, you know, one wonderful thing that happened years ago, like in 2007, w- yeah. which is 
which is which was the beginning of trying to which was the beginning of actually being able to figure out how he got a liver transplant um is in 2007 there was a detective at the kitazawa police station who had been who had who had been transferred there from the organized crime control division at the headquarters yeah so he was downloading porn onto his computer and it was yeah. what they go the file exchange service like napster like you yeah. kids probably don't remember these but there used to be like upload download kind of things i remember napster and i think that was around the time that i was born <laughs> yeah. so you know so before there was so japan had its own homegrown file exchange service called winnie yeah. which was designed by okay. a kyoto a kyoto academic yeah and this guy like downloaded a bunch of like terrible porn like tentacle porn and stuff onto his computer and he uploaded the entire <laughs> database on the yamaguchi gumi and the godogumi um you know like like gigabytes of information onto winnie which and as soon as i heard about it That's wild. And, you know i'm not i'm not very good with these things i called this hacker i you know worked before i'm like do you understand winnie and he's like yeah and i'm like download these things for me and i will give you money so he did <laughs> you know it, it took me you know like a couple of weeks to go through all the files, but it was like, you know, his client companies, people on his payroll, yeah. uh, just listed his various mistresses. Um, I mean, you know, it's, you could certainly say that, you know, not only was a sociopath, but he must have had incredible stamina and libido. Yeah. <laughs> of, um, and, uh, and, you know, including in other words, his passport numbers, um, his records of his travel in and out of the country. I mean, the police had a great job. That wasn't meant for public consumption. Right. But, uh, you know, it, it gives you a, a great idea of the scale of his operations. So in for, the, for getting his transplant, his deal with the FBI was to basically give information about the Yakuza, right? So you have to understand that, the, you know, the United States... Um, and the Japan's National Police Agency have had a sort of antagonistic yeah. relationship for many years. I think it's gotten much better. Yeah. But the United States isn't happy to have Yakuza operating in their territory. Yeah. But to identify Japanese organized crime members, you need not just their names, but you need the kanji for their names. You need their date of birth. Because that's you know, one of the problems with Japanese is there's so many names that sound the same. Yeah. Because Japan only has five vowels, right? Yeah. That's why you have the kanji. And the National Police Agency, citing personal privacy protection laws, refused to give this information to the United States, making it very hard for the United States to track any Yakuza activity in and out of the States. Yeah. So Goto Tadamasa, when he realized that he had to get a, use, a, a liver transplant, arranged to get one done at UCLA. Yeah. Um, but he needed a visa to get into the country. Right. And so... Through one of his henchmen, he approached the U.S. Embassy and he approached the legal attaché at the U.S. Embassy. Um, I'm giving away if if you if you are if anyone hasn't read the book, I'm giving away a lot of the, of this right now. You know, yeah. we should put a spoiler alert here. Put a spoiler alert here later. But you should you should still read the book regardless, even if you do listen to this. It's incredible. But please continue. You know, so he was a deal that, that, that basically they offered him was, um, it's like I will give you information about. Yakuza activity in the United States, names, dates of birth, you know, a, a wealth of information about not just my group, but other groups. Because yeah. Yakuza cha exchange a lot of information. Uh, as a matter of fact, I will show you this here. Yeah. This is a internal notebook from the Yamaguchi Gumi in around mm -hmm. 2005. Mm -hmm. um, it lists all their phone numbers and organizations and addresses of groups within Tokyo that they have friendly relations with okay. and of their own members as well. So you have, if you had this information, you could give this to the FBI and you would suddenly have a list yeah. of all these Yakuza bosses, their affiliations, where their homes were, what their addresses were. You know, yeah. this is like an internal document within the Yamaguchi Gumi itself. Notice the lovely embossing, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's actually a pretty beautiful cover. <laughs> Um, that's so, you know, that's the kind of information that, that he could offer to them. Um, and, you know, and so the, the U.S. was like, okay, we'll get you a visa. Um, uh, I think Im Immigration Customs Enforcement, um, ICE was like, like, we don't want to do this. But, uh, you know, the FBI leaned down, you know, put pressure on them and the deal was done. Except 
that, you know, he only gave them about 20% of what he promised. And as soon as he got his liver and, you know, was, was yeah. good, he like left the hospital and, and, and really screwed the FBI on it. I think that he actually went to Hawaii and played golf before going back to Japan. <laughs> That's brutal. I can't imagine being a, mem a member of the FBI on that case, then realizing that you've just had the wall pulled over your eyes, essentially. That must have been pretty brutal. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I believe that Jim Stern, Special Agent Jim Stern, who was like one of the few, well, the only Japanese, the only Jewish Japanese special agent ever in the FBI, to my knowledge. Really? Um, and also the only one to ever arrest a Yakuza boss on American soil said you know his remark on the whole affair was like you know it's like get the information first that's informant 101 yes. <laughs> get the information then give them what you promised he said like they should have dangled a liver in front of him until he coughed up everything he knew and I was like, <laughs> exactly oh man yeah wasted opportunity for sure so when Goto he gets his liver he's feeling good he goes to Hawaii to play golf he goes back to Japan he then gets expelled from the Yamaguchi Gumi in, I like, can't remember what, yeah. Years later, years later, right? This is years all later. 2000, so I, I think. Um, what's, what's happening in between him getting his liver transplant and speaking to the FBI, even though it was only a little amount, like he didn't give tons of information, he did still speak, which from what I understand, you don't do that. Like, you just yeah, don't but, do but, that nobody, but nobody knew, people had suspicions, okay. right? But okay. he just said, you know, I'm well connected. I got it and I got my liver picked. And, you know, when he got out, um, he, you know, he bragged to people. I was like, apparently he, the the donor. And well, there's some questions of how much of a donor that was. In between him, like the suspicions from the Yakuza of him potentially revealing something, there's no proof. At what point, so what was the smoking gun for him to then finally get expelled from the Yamaguchi Gumi? Well, well, the smoking gun kind of went like this. I was doing a study of human trafficking in Japan. And while I yeah. was working on that, there was that huge leak of materials from the, from the police, right? And, you know, and looking through yeah. his passport records and his travel records in the United States and some other things in there that due to source confidentiality, I'm not going to explain. I was like, okay, yeah. I, I pieced together exactly what happened. Yeah. Um, and then... Um, decided that I would write about it because he's yeah. a horrible person. And I thought, you know, uh, this is someone who deserves to go down. Plus it's a, just a great story because it wasn't just him. There's three other Yakuza bosses who got liver transplants at UCLA. And, oh. you know, and, and because these guys have got liver transplants and other more worthy people who are waiting died. Yeah. Um, Terrible. And, you know, I'm, you know, I am, I feel, it is my opinion because I don't want to be sued, that a huge amount of money must have been paid to the doctor who decided that these were good candidates. Um, because in reality, um, it really is the doctor, the surgeon who has the final call. I mean, I have the UCLA's internal report yeah. on the uh, on the liver transplants, which I, which I might actually put on the internet on, yeah. on the um, uh, sometime around the sometime around the start of the show but it clearly you know seems very dodgy the whole reasoning and rationale for these yeah. guys getting their so but the, so i tried to write the article um in a japanese magazine and at the very last minute not only did they pull the article they pulped some of the original issues and like um, i'm was waiting in a hotel for them to get this done yeah. Um, eventually I realized that only a U.S. newspaper would publish it. So published it in the Washington Post. Yeah. And then at the same time, because I realized this, you know, this guy is really scary. Publishing in the Washington Post, I, the Japanese media might not follow it up. So I made a backdoor deal with the L.A. Times. Like all this is going on. Yeah. Because the hospital was UCLA. It's like, I will keep the name of the hospital out of the Washington Post article. And they're okay yeah. with that. You can run with it. I'll work with you on this story. And then it's your, you know, it's your scoop. So the Washington Post is not interested. And yeah. so, you know, after the LA, when it came out in the Washington Post, like the Japanese media was like, I got, I got a bunch of like, cause everybody knew me, right? They, I got a bunch of yeah. calls. 
they're like, are you going to write anything more? And I'm like, you know, this is a good story. Like, why don't you investigate it yourself? I yeah. go talk to the National Police Agency. And they were like, no, you know, you know it's kind of scary. And I'm like, <laughs> but, but, but then, so it comes out in the LA Times. And this is, this is I think, a low point in Japan and Japanese journalism. But this happens more often than it should. Yeah. So what does the Japanese media do? Because it's on the front page of the LA Times. They're like, according to an article in the LA Times, um, several Yakuza bosses got liver transplants at the UCLA after making a deal. <gasps> One of them made a deal with the FBI. And I was like, wow. Great way to save your skin. <laughs> yeah, like, wow, that's just, just not cool. <laughs> That's incredible. What was going, so when you, after you wrote that article, you're talking to the Washington Post to get it out into the open. What's going through your mind for your own safety? I mean, here's everybody else freaking out about Gotto and the fact well, that, you know. You know, I, I don't want to yell at my original publisher, Tokyo Vice, because it would be, you know, because it's not their fault. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, so basically, you know, Tokyo Vice was under wraps and I was hoping to unveil this whole liver transplant thing in the book when it got published. And then yeah. my original publisher, which is a Japanese publisher on their European website, put the like put a, a like a summary of the book in such detail that anybody who was who was worried about this could yeah. find out. And, yeah. you know, even in 2000 and 2008, I don't I think that you know, go to had enough people working for him to have Google alerts on. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so somehow it came to his attention and then I, I got put under police protection. Um, okay. So I'm like under police protection. And when I went under police protection, which, you know, it isn't like it is in the movies because it's, it's, it's not like there's a car in front of your house all the time or yeah. anything like that. Um, yeah. One of the cops who, you know, who I talked with was like, look, you know, you're a writer, right? Like, you know, it's publisher Paris, dude. Like, you know, he's a businessman. You know, you're you're writing something that jeopardizes his career and his standing in the Yakuza. He says, yeah. but, you know, you know, if he can't shut you up because it's already out, then he's not going to bother with you. So you need to get it published somewhere, anyway. Exactly, And then you'll yeah. be in a better place. Um, and, and before the, uh, you know, and I don't know if I've, I think I've talked about this before, but, um, before the, you know, before the Washington Post article came out, I went and talked to um, a member of a rival group in the Yamaguchi community. And I went to talk to one of his lieutenants. Like, you know, I couldn't get to the big guy. Um, but I went to talk to one of his lieutenants. I knew who, who he was. And I was like, look, you know, I'm working on this article. Yeah. Um, about go to Tanamasa and this deal he made, which he kind of screwed you guys over. I was really hoping I could get a comment. But the subtext of that interview, which I don't really spell out in the books, is like basically like, like here is an opportunity for you to get rid of a thorn in your side and claim yeah. his earth and territory, knock him out because he's done things that are unacceptable. You just have to keep me alive. And that was that was the subtext of that conversation. And they they took it. <laughs> I'm assuming. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I felt much <laughs> yeah and, and, exactly. And, and it was during this period of time that I was like, oh, I'm like, I'm way over my head. Um, and I'm like, how do you, you know, how do you, you know, how do you protect yourself? Like I got the police, you know, but I, you know, I, I need some, some form of insurance. Like I can't leave insurance, the house. Yeah. Right. So, you know, through, through connections, um, I got a retired Yakuza boss. We, who I call Saigo in the book to take me on as a bodyguard yeah. he just kicked out of his organization and he you know he had a reputation for for being i mean i mean he called him tsunami because he had a reputation for unpredictable incredible violence and i was like this is yeah. somebody i would love to have as a bodyguard and it turns out yeah. i don't want to spoil the last chapter because he had his reasons for being accepting the job as well because he, he yeah. had a son and, and no yeah. job um and son was just like a little baby and so you know, yeah. when the article finally came out of the Washington Post, I felt really relieved. When it came out of the LA yeah. Times, I was even happier. Yeah. And then, uh, and then uh, finally, you know, to make sure that he really got kicked out because there was a lot of grumbling about him. I wrote all the details of 
what had happened and how he'd sold out the organization in a book called like Heisei Taboo, like the taboos of Heisei 2008, which doesn't actually make sense because Heisei is actually a different year, but um, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and that book was like, got picked up by everybody. What was really funny about the book is it comes out and it's, it has all the details of how he screwed everybody over and the names of all the other Yakuza that got liver transplants. And yeah. I went to, you know, I went to buy it at a bookstore and the owner said, yeah, like all our copies of this book keep getting bought out. Like, and then I'm like, and I'm like, what kind of people are buying? He's like, all these scary people are coming. Like, we, <laughs> do they get them in? Oh my God. <laughs> I mean, good for, good for your sales, but still. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, was like, I was like, I wasn't getting, I didn't get anything except a little bit of money from that. I was like, God damn. Oh. <laughs> but, but you know, the irony is that the people that published the book that basically put him out of business because I was told that when he was, when they were finally basically firing him from the Yamaguchi Gumi, that one of the bosses took a copy of the book and hit him on the head with it, saying, um, saying it doesn't oh. matter whether it's true or not. If people are writing this kind of stuff about you, yeah. then you're the problem. You're a liability um, at that point, yeah. But later, that same publisher that published the book that 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 solidified his expulsion from the Yamaguchi Gumi later published his biography, which was a bestseller. And I was like, wow, that's kind of you know i'm like i'm kind of like i, I gave you that you know like I, I, gave you a, I gave you a great selling book and then you then you and then you sign a contract with my moral enemy i feel like they should have given you a percentage of the revenue from gotto's book yeah i do i, I got a i got an unfavorable mention in his biography. Did you? oh yeah yeah <laughs> He, he refers to me with the same words he referred to Itami Juzo as Fuyukai, meaning like, meaning basically the, the message was like, like, please kill this guy and I will reward you. And I was like, this is, this is not, this is not good. That's mad. Yeah, I really need to read his book, actually. It's quite hard to get in English in the UK for some reason. So after you released the article, you didn't go straight back to Japan, if I remember correctly. You stayed in the US for a bit, I think. No, no, I was, I was. Okay. Uh, I was in Japan for as soon as, as soon as, as soon as I was told I was under police protection, I'm, like, okay. I'm not going to be able to go home until I get this resolved. Yeah. Because it's okay. taking a lot of trouble home with me. Yeah. I mean, your family were, re remind me, your family were in the U.S., like your parents uh, were yeah, in the parents, U.S. My, my parents were in the U.S., my, yeah. my, my, my ex and my kids were there. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, um, and you know the, so the the the, the you know the, this was very nice the fbi which yeah. could have been dicks about the whole thing because i basically sort of made them look bad i didn't really make them look bad but i mean i did explain that their reasons for wanting that information were legitimate but yeah. i didn't make them look good because of the fact that we kind of got screwed by goto didn't didn't look yeah so great yeah um yeah exactly but they you know they they, they worked with the local sheriff and they were sort of patrolling my parents place and making sure that everyone was safe so that, you know that's good I, i'm grateful yeah yeah that's good um as best you can manage a scenario like that i guess one of the things that you talk about in tokyo vice that really stuck out for me and is something that i really wanted to ask you about was the fact that when you're in it when you're like in the thick of it you kind of forget about the victims and that you almost admire and respect the criminals because you know they're very intelligent and they're able to do things that probably most people don't have the capacity to do and it's actually quite impressive in a twisted way as a journalist how do you how do you juggle that sense of trying to remember that there are victims that are the product of this activity that these yakuza are doing with also this kind of ad admiration in a way of these people who are doing these things is there a is there a conflict as a journalist as you're trying to juggle these two things or is it something that you just kind of it's kind of tunnel vision and maybe you think about it more upon reflection after the you know after the case came out i think it's like the that as you're doing it especially when you're when you're you're on a deadline you're really tired um it, it, there's there's a couple there's a couple things that are happening once you just become jaded like so everything is so yeah done this story before i've done these things before you're checking the boxes and you, you know and and you it can become become easy to become insensitive just because you you know you're 
you've you've learned to uh, uh, separate yourself from these things because you have to uh, keep some emotional distance or you can't continue doing the job, right? Yeah. So you have to remember like, oh yeah, like, you know, I, you, you know, the, the, you know, this person is in the process of grieving, like this is, you know, something that's never happened to them before. And though you met many people, it's happened to, so, you know, this happens, you know, it feels like something that happens often. It's yeah. for this person, this is the most tragic day of their life. So you have to really put your thing there. But the other thing that happens is that when you're dealing with sociopaths a lot, right. And you, you know, you have to talk to them. And you sort of pick up a technique from you learned from the police. And I I think that, which is that basically everyone wants to justify themselves. So you sort of, you know, you you learn to sort of be like, well, you know, of course you killed him because they were asking for it. If, you know, if he'd just done what you wanted, you know, you were asking for a reasonable thing, but now of course they had to say no. So what else were you going to do at that point? And that, that kind of, it's not like, it's not, you know, it's not like some, tv-like thing where you become the monster that you've been writing about but your yeah. your ability to empathize with them or at least see things from their viewpoint can you know if you're not careful seep into your daily life and you have to remember that no that's pathological thinking like no this person didn't yeah. do anything you know yeah. they're the victim yeah. you know just just because they fell for it or they weren't smart enough to be wary or they were too trusting that so doesn't make them someone deserving of what happened to them you know, but in the minds of these guys, so it's like, oh, well, you know, if you weren't, if they weren't such a sucker, this wouldn't have happened to them. Or if they yeah. just, if they just paid the money instead of trying to leave the club, I wouldn't have had to throw them out the window. Yeah. It's such a twisted way of looking at it. <laughs> but, I mean, fair enough. If that's the way they justify it, that's the way they justify it. You talk, uh, you just mentioned about burning out um, because, you know, there was a particular point, I think, in your career before you really started to get into the Yakuza that you were reporting on the kind of like dirty side of the sex industry in Japan. And I know, I remember there's one bit, I won't talk about it too much because you should just go read it in the book. But one of my favorite bits in the book is where you talk about how you went to Kabukicho and you went on like a night out, I think, with like the deputy vice, the deputy of vice, I think, um, of the police. And there's a, a reflection that you have later on the book where you say that that started to really take a toll on you mentally and you started to feel dirty almost. So that's kind of what I got from it. How did you, how did you kind of get back to a sense of, of normalcy after the case came out and after you were able to maybe go back to some semblance of normal life and you weren't, you know, fearing for your life every second, like how were you able to get back to a normal, I say normal like that, take oh, normal in any way? Yeah. You know, it, it's kind of like, so after I left the, you know, after I left the newspaper, I was kind of like, all right, I'm going to go to law school. I'm going to, you know, start a new life. Like I've had my reporter experience, you know, like, okay, I didn't write that article about the liver transplant that I wanted to, but you know, like, you know, you know, uh, I've, you know, I've done, there's no more to be learned from being a newspaper reporter. And then um, the state department lured me back into doing this study of human trafficking in Japan. And that yeah. was, that was really like, that was, that really started to, I mean, I just sort of I kind of gotten out of the world and I decided to go back in because it seemed meaningful because the yeah. purpose of the, the purpose of writing that report was to get was to shame Japan into putting yeah. real legislation that would deal with human trafficking on the books um, and and actually enforce it. Yeah. Um, and, and and also the fact that I had a huge budget and that I could do things you could never do as a journalist, which is I could buy information. Yeah. I, mean, I could buy information from criminals. That was really you know. You, 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 I did a lot of interviews, but I also did interviews with the people involved in it um, and people who'd escaped. And it was just like, uh, it, and, you know, makes everything, every, you know, you begin to look at sex as just a transactional thing, like a commodity. Yeah. yeah. So it was, it wasn't very healthy. Um, yeah. I, I, I'm, you know, I, it, it, I mean, the whole thing, you know, I mean, I did burn out and it felt, I mean, it felt like important work. But it would, but it just so, you know, so seedy. But at the same time, this also I had this weird realization, um, and then I'll, then I'll answer your question. It's kind of a roundabout story. So I yeah. realized, right? Everybody likes to think of themselves as the good guy. Yeah. 
right? So, true. so, so yeah. when I was working on this, and I wasn't a reporter. I mean, I'm you know, I think I was telling people I was an insurance investigator, um, and I was buying information from from Yakuza, um, and they were ratting out the Yakuza, you know, and the organizations and the individuals involved in human trafficking. Um, sometimes they wouldn't take the money because you know. Maybe they're a loan shark, or maybe they're running a, a bar that rips off people, or maybe yeah. they're, you know, just your standard yeah, because of collecting protection money from people. But they're like, oh, but I'm not a human trafficker. I'm not slaving people. You know, I'm not, uh, you know, uh, I'm, I'm not involved in rape or sexual assault or, you know, preying on women or threatening their families. Like, you know, I'm above that. And, yeah. and in that sense, it's like, okay, there's somebody lower on the pole than you, and you have some moral justification for feeding me this information when you know that the purpose is to put these people out of business. Like, you're like, this is a shameful activity for us to be involved in. And that was good. I was like, oh, you know, it's nice that there's even, that there is, there is a bottom barrel of level of morality that a lot of people have, yeah. the bad guys. <laughs> um, it, you know, when I was done with the report and I turned it in, I'm like, you know, I stayed friends with some of the prostitutes and some of the strippers and sources, but I just like, don't frequent those places. I'm just like, like, you know, I don't, I don't, people like, you know, want to go to some place in Kabukicho. I know a couple places, um, but yeah. it's not entertaining to me. I'm not interested. I'm not interested in, you know, st strip bars and CD places. It's just like, yeah. And, and once you're out of it and you're having a normal, healthy relationship with, um, you know, someone, preferably a monogamous relationship, you, you know, yeah. you're okay. It took about two, yeah. two, three years before I just felt like I wasn't, uh, that I wasn't carrying a layer of grime around myself. That's good. That's a long time, but I'm glad you got out of it. Yeah. Um, one of the people that you mentioned quite a lot in the book, and I think Ken Watanabe's character in the show is based on this person kitagiri yes. um the real life person being sakaguchi you mentioned him quite a lot and you talk about how he was a role model and a mentor what was one what if i had if you had to pick like one key lesson that you learned from him what would that be a, a key lesson i learned from him was um that if you are doing the right thing that you will, you will, you will, you will have enemies, and you should accept that. You yeah. can't be liked by everybody else. If you are doing the right thing, um, if you're standing up for justice, um, then uh, then you will make enemies. And most people um, don't make enemies because they don't stand for anything. They just bend with the wind. Right. So, so like if you stand up straight, if you stand up for the right thing, if you do the right thing, if you tell the truth, you will make enemies because um, there will be people who resent that or, and, and you will get in their way. And, and yeah. you know, I, as someone who kind of wanted to be liked, you know, I, I think I was bitching about uh, some, you know, I think I was, I think it's not in the book, but, I, but there was, um, Saitama had a huge problem with dioxin. Okay. Uh, in, you know, dioxin and pollution. And uh, I had done a lot of writing on it. And, uh, you know, um, I got a lot of blowback from the government itself about my writing and my studies. And yeah. uh, they even fictionalized a, a, the results of a survey to make it look like there was no problem, which I, which I later uncovered. But I was like, man, I'm just like getting hammered and there's all this pushback and people writing nasty you know i'm you know my editors are yelling at me and he's like you know look yeah. you know you're like you are on the right path you are doing the right thing and he's like yeah. you you know that is part that is a sign that you are doing things right he says you know you know you, you know someone by their enemies as well as you know them by their friends you're making enemies yeah. in the right place so that was really important to me it's like okay you're not gonna you're not gonna be liked by everybody if you do if you do your job well and that's fine yeah Exactly. Yeah. You're on the right side of history. Let's just put it like that. <laughs> yeah, you're on the right side of history. Yeah. Um, one, of the, one of the things that you talk about, I think it might be in The Last Yakuza, which is the book that's coming out soon. Um, you talk about, it might have been in Tokyo Vice, I can't remember, but you talk about how many people in Japanese society 
have no one to confide in, confide in or express their worries, secrets or disappointments to. I thought that was really interesting because I think that's quite indicative of the culture. I'm curious whether you think or what do you think about the fact that is, is that potentially a reason why the Yakuza could thrive in a place like Japan is because it's so secretive and people are so kind of it's all about saving face and it's all about perception. Uh, you know, when you are shameless in a culture of shame, you can get a lot yeah. done because yeah. it, people who feel shame are weak in your eyes, right? You're shameless. Yeah. yeah. It gives you a, a power to manipulate people. And, you know, and, and also, you know, yes, very much. That's one of the reasons that, you know, it's a secret society. People are embarrassed about having their personal details released. And that gives you a certain power over them. It certainly gives you power to blackmail them. Yeah. Um, you know, at one point, um, you know, Tokyo Vice is, hold on, I'm going to turn on the heat out a little bit. It's getting quite chilly here. There is. So in, in many ways, Tokyo Vice is a little more um, revealing than I wanted it to be. Yeah. But part of that happened because at a certain point in my life, um, there was a detective agency called Garu Detective Agency, which has done work for the Yamaguchi Gumi, various factions over the ages. They've been caught a couple of times. At least, they've been caught at least once. Interesting. So, um, yeah, detective agencies are one of, uh, you know, a, a, an obvious front company for Yakuza, right? You know, because you're yeah. you know, people's information and you're being hired to investigate people, right? Yeah. Sometimes they double cross their clients, right? you know, <laughs> meaning, like, you know, the, the, the wife wants to know, like, is my husband cheating on them? They find out the evidence that the husband is cheating on them. The husband is the one who's the main earner and they go to him and say, like, we can bear this report for you and tell your yeah. wife that you're not cheating but it's going to cost you. Yeah. Mm. Good anyway, one of these guys contacted some of my friends very, and, and, and my friends alerted me like this, some guys asking questions about you. And so, you know, I, uh, I said, tell him to go, you know, set up a meeting at a cafe and I'll show up. And I, I met with the guy and I said, look, you can go tell your boss. And I know who your boss is that um, uh, everything embarrassing I've ever done. I'm putting in this book. There's nothing, that you can that you can come up with that you can blackmail me about because it's all in there it'll all be in there and, yeah. and i said and I, and I have photo of, of you um like in my mailbox and technically i can have you arrested for trespassing so you be very careful when you pass out to your to your boss in your report it's because yeah. anytime like anytime like you've already trespassed me i have the evidence so you you should consider that when the next time you're writing a report and he's like oh <laughs> Um, but I was like, okay, so, you know, if you, if you, if you confess to everything and you put everything out there, there's not a lot you can be used to be blackmailed for. It's not, a, yeah. it's not a great position to be in. Yeah. Um, but the other thing that returning to your point about, um, you know, Japan is a very lonely place and it, because, you know, people expect to keep things inside. I, I read a recent survey that said, you know, uh, I think eight out of 10 men in their fifties do not have a close friend wow. outside that's of work. A lot. Yeah. And I was like, wow, that is a lonely society. Very lonely. Yeah. That's hard. <laughs> and the work culture in which you're, you know, you wake up, you go to work, you come home, uh, especially old, isn't conducive to having a personal life. So yeah. that also creates this whole industry of hostesses and host clubs, because in a country where we, you know, people don't have therapists, where can you go and talk to someone where who will listen to you and sympathize and give you some encouragement? Yeah. Um, you know, there's nobody, right? You yeah. don't have close friends. The closest may be the host at the club or the hostess yeah. at the club. Yeah. Is that changing? You know, that was, you know, 20, 30 years ago. Is that still the case now or is it starting to change? Is, I think it's starting. I think it's, I think, I think younger generations of Japanese people yeah. are begin beginning to have a home life. I think that's beginning yeah. to change. I think a lot of younger people are not like, I'm not dedicating my life to this company because the company is not going to have my back. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's a good shift to happen. Let's talk a little bit about The Last Yakuza. So your new book coming out, I've, I've read it. I, I was um, 
really lucky that I actually got an early copy of the book. We won't talk about details because people should just go buy the book and read it because it is fantastic. But the the interesting thing that I really like about this book is because Top Your Vice is really about you and it's about your journey and about your interactions with, you know, very senior members of the of the Yakuza. This book I felt was very intimate. I think the, that that's definitely true of Tokyo Vice as well. But I felt like by the end of the book, I knew Saigo. And Saigo, oh, yes. you, you mentioned Saigo earlier on. He's the bodyguard that you hired, ex-Yakuza. How did you how did you actually meet Saigo? I don't remember seeing that in the book. Like, how what was the journey of him actually becoming your bodyguard? So, you know, the first time I met Saigo was when in Tokyo Vice, remember there was the, the Yakuza boss who 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 disappeared um yeah endo makoto and and his driver right yeah um so i don't in, in tokyo vice i didn't really spell it out but you know i kind of obfuscated because at the time it seemed like it would be easy to identify her but but basically endo's endo's dead and his mistress who i interviewed and i just hooked up so we're hooking yeah. up <laughs> um, I, think, I think i said she was like a bar host who worked the same bar as the mistress that was the mistress yeah. we're hooked up and you know i'm at i might get her apartment and like he came looking for her you know <laughs> i mean he came looking for endo right because endo's been yeah. missing and i he knocks on the door and i come out and he's like you know you know like who you know like kind of like who are you motherfucker and i'm like who are you <laughs> and i wasn't i wasn't flinching i was like i'm not gonna flinch and, you know we're sort of having this shouting contest and, and, and then i'm like like and I'm like, and he's like, you know, so that's like, that's like, you know, you're with Endo's woman. And I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, like well, you know, it's not good news for you. Your buddy is dead. Your buddy is dead and <laughs> taking care of his girl. <laughs> you should be thanking. <laughs> and, and he just thought that was hilarious, right? It was just like this, this gaijin with this chutzpah, right? And, uh, and he was like, okay, you know. So that was our first meeting. And then you know, when I needed a bodyguard, I heard that he had been out of, uh, that he had been, you know, out of the business and that he was looking, you know, he needed a job. Yeah. And the person that connected us, the person that connected us had no idea we'd met before. And I just felt like, you know, I'll just play along. So we, you know, like the first time we met, I was like, oh, nice to be, you know, because I'm like, why, well, I, we don't, I don't really need to, he doesn't need to know that we have a history to, you know, a history yeah. together. So. That's hilarious. Yeah, it, it it seems like it was fate that you guys were supposed to meet again. <laughs> um, yeah, the first was... time I met him, he had a lot more, a lot more hair. He'd like he'd got he'd had hepatitis C, and so he'd gotten yeah. interferon to, to treat it, which it worked, but he lost a lot of hair. So it was a kind of you know. Yeah, that was quite hepatitis C was quite common for yakuza, right? I think a lot of it came from the tattoos, sharing right? Needles. Sharing needles as well. Yeah, yeah. Um. That was one thing I didn't actually realize after reading, well, as I was reading The Last Yakuza, is actually how much of a problem drug addiction was. Like, I didn't, because I think with the, I think we said earlier, the Inagawa Kai, like, they have rules, right? Like, you don't take drugs, blah, 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 blah. But Saigo, you know, he had a really horrible addiction to, I think it was meth, right? Crystal meth. Right, right. Um, and there's moments in the book that felt very visceral um, of, like about his experiences or your recounting of his experiences when he was, you know, trying to keep clean, but he couldn't. And I think there was one story that I really liked when coach um, came into the book and he walked into his apartment and just basically said, get the fuck up. <laughs> like, we have a meeting to go to. I, I love that part. Like, I, I was just like, yeah, I feel like everybody needs a coach in, in their yeah, life. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Kanazawa san was a, was a, was a wonderful yeah, person, you know? Yeah. I mean, you know, there were times he flinched when he should have stood up, but, you know, but everybody has those moments, but he was good. Of course. Um, yeah. I think I posted you... some photos of him on Instagram. Yeah. Did you, you spent quite a bit of time with him? Yes, but spending time with with Kanazawa-san was really difficult because 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 Saigo wasn't comfortable with me talking to his boss, so I had to sneak around and talk to his boss. Interesting. And, and I don't know what that discomfort was. I have no idea. But that's kind of like that's kind of like okay, you and I are talking, but you never tell Saigo that we talk directly. He's like, that's fine. It's like, and, and I'm like, I don't, and I'm like, can't we, you know, wouldn't it be nice if all three of us could just sit down at a table? And it's like, 
<laughs> no. <laughs> like, no, like not not gonna happen <laughs> like, that's so interesting do you think it was because maybe because that was his that was his senior so he just didn't want to be in the same room as him i don't know that's so interesting i mean, I, 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 know, I don't I, I didn't you know there's there's some things you know that you know you just after get a yeah it depends after a while you learn to live in a gray zone you're just like okay you're not going to talk about that you, you know, to press further would be rude. Fine. I just, you know, not necessary. You're talking to me. Yeah. That's fine. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's totally fine. Uh, one of the other, one of the other people that you mentioned in the last episode, and this is the last thing that I'll mention, because like I said, you should just go, people should just go read the book, um, is, a, is a guy who went by the name of Takahiko Inui. And he, oh, Inoue san, the Buddha. Yeah, in, exactly. They called him the, the Buddhist Yakuza, right? I think that was his name. Yeah. Um, super interesting guy because he's one of those people that seem to actually have quite a strong moral code, which for a Yakuza is a bit odd, <laughs> given what they're in the business of. I'm curious, what were your, did, did you meet him in person? Like, what were your experiences with him and what were your perspectives on him? I, I only got to meet him a couple times, like two or three at the most. Yeah. Um, my experience is, you know, great guy, really fun when yeah. he was drunk, but also <laughs> that that he had had a sort of a sort of enlightenment, and he felt that you know he wanted to take the organization legit. I mean, he was like, I'm like, I'm gonna, you know, I'm setting awesome. up real businesses, and, yeah. and and his justification for running the organization was like, if I don't show these people the way. If I can't teach them to be better human beings, who will? Yeah. Um, he was really a really a really interesting person and very well spoken. And uh, I mean, one of the things is it's interesting is that um, like I'm now a Zen Buddhist priest. I'm really low ranking. I actually, after the second half of this year, I got to start doing this koan this koan practice where they give you one of these riddles to to solve. You know? Oh my gosh. You know, I think, yeah. What is the sound of hand clapping? I, I I took my my Zen master out for lunch a, a couple of days ago, uh, like last week, to really expensive lunch, basically to say like, look, like I know that I'm behind on my training, but you know, um, <laughs> you know, give me give me until July, and then you know the rest of the year I'm not working on a book, I'm not working on anything else. I'll I'll put in yeah. the time, to, you know, to learn this this and this. And yeah. I was like, okay. Like, okay if you have it i see that you've got a schedule so all right <laughs> but uh you know he seemed a very in, in sort of enlightened figure and um you know he and his book he wrote a book about you know a, a book that yeah. i read very early on, i thought was really good kanazawa was like no yakuza should write a book and when he when he when you know i gave him a copy like threw it away like, in front of <laughs> the trash. but 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 you know, once when I was with Kanazawa in one of his offices, I saw that he had Inoue's book on the shelf. And I was <laughs> you supported him deep down. You chart the kind of decline of the Yakuza. Now, from what I understand, and I got a lot of this from you as well, um, and just from other reading that I've done, is, is that the Yakuza is still very much a present part of society. It's just not to the scale that it once was. In what capacity do the Yakuza still function now even though it kind of went through it's it's kind of past its heyday um they're still involved in stock manipulation fraud a lot of fraud okay. especially with all the wire me the money fraud um okay. they've been involved in cryptocurrency finally you know uh, finally they're getting smarter about that interesting <laughs> still you know certain in the red light districts extortion blackmail um a little bit of loan sharking but you know the the the, the numbers have gone down so much and it's so hard yeah. for them to do business that they're a shadow of what they used to be yeah um they still have a a hold in the entertainment industry but less than they used to yeah. um so you know they diminish all the time they just keep losing ter territory and turf and people and they're aging because no one wants to join so the yeah. average age of Yakuza is now 54. And okay, 54. wow. I will yeah. be 55 this year on March 28th. Um, and I'm, and I'm waiting. I'm hoping that we'll sort of grow old together as we fade out. I'm hoping that this year <laughs> you know, that they'll announce the, net, the average age of Yakuza is 55. <sighs> we know, like two years running, we've been, you know, together. Yeah. Oh, I, 
I, something funny that funny about my birthday. Um, you know, a couple of years ago, I was talking to someone from the Inagawa Kai, and they, you know, like my birthday was coming up, and they, and they're, and they're like, and they're like, is there you know, is there anybody famous born on your birthday? And I was like, uh, yeah, there's like Kanda Uno. She's a she's an actress, and they're like, and, and like, and they're like, oh, and you know, it was an, and it was another guy with them, and, and he was like, oh. March 28th, like your birthday is the birthday of the third generation leader of the Yamaguchi Gumi, the greatest godfather that ever lived. I was like, <gasps> like, really? And he's yeah, like, result. <laughs> like, like, what, 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 and he looked it up on Wikipedia and it's like, it like 1913, you know. Oh, I like, wow. I was like, I was like, I didn't even know what to say about that. <laughs> not necessarily something to celebrate right <laughs> well you know yeah, maybe, maybe we would have gotten along but <laughs> that's true that is true what was the um i've only got a few more questions left jake i'm very conscious that we're actually coming up to the two hour mark which is double what we initially planned but um it's been incredible and i've, I've learned a lot and i think a lot of people um who especially haven't read your books will get a lot from this as well if there was kind of you know, one to two lessons that you've learned in your career, reporting on the Yakuza, investing in the Yakuza, what, like what's the kind of like one thing that you took from that entire experience, factoring the ups and the downs, the risk that you had to yourself, to your family, coming out of that experience upon reflection, like what's, what's something that kind of hit you after that whole experience? One is um, don't betray people that trust you because then you're never able to trust anyone. Yeah. Um, the second is that uh, reciprocity is very important. Like you need to keep, you need to be grateful for the service that are done to you, even if they have an ulterior motive and return in, in, in full. And when that, when the time comes to pay up, um, it's not going to be at a convenient time for you and it's not going to be easy, but you know, it will only mean something at that time. So people yeah. need you when you need you. Yeah. And people need you when they need you. They don't need you later. They need you then. then and yeah. you have to drop what you do and, and, and do it. Um, then you, you know, then not only do you feel good about yourself, but, you know, a lot of surprisingly number of people realize that you're an honorable person, right? That you keep your bargains, you repay your debts. That's really important. Yeah. Uh, and I guess the third thing is that it's important to do the right thing. Yeah. But don't expect to be rewarded for it and make sure that you, that when you do it, that you protect yourself. Um, I mean, I learned that not just from the, you know, from this job, but things that have happened to my father and other things, it's like, you know, like you, you write the truth and you do the right thing, but you know, but expect to be attacked for it, which is like when I left my last job, that's why I took a, like a, a, a huge file of compromising material by my former employer because I knew that someday yeah. that I would need. Um, you gotta, you gotta, you, you should do the right thing, but you have yeah. to think about the repercussions of doing that. Definitely, yeah. I think advice very relevant, even if you're not fighting the yakuza. To be honest, lessons to be taken. <laughs> <by everybody. laughs> Hopefully not. Most people aren't fighting the yakuza or people like the yakuza. Um, but thank you. That's really. Really I, mean, informative. I, I am glad to see them fade out. I mean, I'm like, you know, yeah. uh, there were some, there were some honorable people and some good people, but I never, I never have seen them as a necessary evil. And I don't yeah. think that Japan will be worse off with them gone. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, I have a few more questions that are a bit more on a light hearted note. Okay. Let's end it on a bit more light hearted. So we have season two of Fuck Your Vice coming out in the next week. Any hints of what is to come in season two? <laughs> Anything you can give us? I, I will I will give you some hints. Um, no, okay. I, I, um, you know, uh, there will be a, a brief appearance of one particular character who everybody loved, hated in the first series, um, who has okay. a huge fault. That's a huge hint. And with everybody in Japan will know who I'm talking about. He comes, really back, curious. He comes back for one episode at least. Um, okay. And yeah, the other thing is that if you want to figure out how the series might 
progress. If you read Tokyo Vice and the last Yakuza, you will have a good idea, but it won't be spoiled for you. <laughs> if you get <laughs> your reading it now. <laughs> but, you'll, you'll, but you'll be ahead of everyone else. Yeah. Um, and the other thing is that I can say is that there is a conclusion that we do okay. not do with a cliffhanger. If there is not a season three of this show, you're not going to be like, what happened? You're not going to be like, like, okay. oh, you know, you know, like Tokyo Vice, it's the West world of Japan. Um, yeah. you know, <laughs> yeah. you know, there, there is no need for a third season. Don't say that. Yeah. <laughs> we want to. I, mean, well, I haven't even. Okay. I haven't even seen it, but I still. I want there to be a third season. <laughs> I, I would love for there to be a third season. But if you don't, if there is no third season, no one is going to leave feeling yeah. like they're cheated. To okay. to some extent, there is a conclusion that will leave you feeling like, okay, I am satisfied. Okay, that's good to know. And are there are there any particular new characters that you're excited about joining the cast? I mean, I remember you did a, a tweet about Tomohisa Yamashita. He joined the cast, who I adore. Like I've watched two shows that he's in, and I think he's absolutely incredible. He's in this season as well. How yeah, was that um, for you? Yeah. The 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 you know the the badass to return from prison, Hamaya. I think uh, I get characters' names wrong sometimes too because I. It's I, okay. I, 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 worse, I conflate them with the real person that they're based on. <laughs> and say their name, which is. Not good. Um, uh, the the guy who plays the Yakuza returns from prison, who is a negative influence. He's just amazing. He's really okay. a good addition to the thing. The okay. female cop from the National Police Agency, um, Nagata San, um, Shoko Nagata is she's an amazing actor. Actor, yeah. uh, I can't say actress anymore. She's an amazing actor. Um, yeah. I realized the other day that her name sort of came together from my co-host on the uh, on the evaporated Shoko Planbeck, and then Lou Nagata, who teaches uh, at Tokyo, who founded Tokyo Pole Dance Fitness. I was like, yeah. oh no, I put their names together, but <laughs> but strong character, <laughs> strong character. <laughs> um, okay. And uh, and I I think you know, I mean, there's lots of roles in there. I'm I'm a huge fan of Ishida, um, Suga, Shun Sugata, who plays the, you know, the, the sort of the good Kumicho, the good boss. Yeah. He's also great in this series as well. He's just really good on screen. He's the, he's the leader of the Chihiro Kai, right? Yeah, Chihiro Kai. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, he's I amazing. See, yeah, he's yeah. amazing. I mean, I just, I love his voice. I just, and, and, and he, yeah. you know, uh, B. Takeshi once said, you know, or Kitano Takeshi once said, you know, if you're, if you play a Yakuza and you, when you're not playing Yakuza walking down the street, people are scared of you, you're not an actor. But if you play an Yakuza right. and you walk down the street then, then, and, and everybody's thinking he's like, you know, this harmless, sweet old man, then you're an actor. And that's like him. Like he's in real life, the sweetest, like <laughs> most wonderful, charming old guy. You would never be afraid of him. But when he's on, when he's on screen playing, the, playing Ishida, he is just like. Oh my um, God. Yeah. yeah. And of course, you know, you probably figured this out. The coach is the model for Ishida. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. He's such a good character. He's actually probably one of my favorite characters in the show. Um, like he steals, I think that's probably down to the actor as well. Like his presence when in whatever scene he's in, he just he just steals it. <laughs> yeah. He's incredible. Oh, yeah, Sato, was, you know, Sho Katsumatsu who plays Sato. Yeah, is really I like charismatic. Sato. He's yeah. really good. But also the funny thing about him, you know, I, I mean, I, I, I can say is that when you meet him in outside of that role, he wears glasses and he's really nerdy and he's very excited. He? <laughs> and he's, you know, it's just like, it's such a contrast because like, the first time I met him, like, you know, after seeing his auditions and stuff, I expected him to be the same person, right? But he's yeah. like, no, he's totally different. I mean, it's, it's like, you know, you know, every movie, Harrison Ford is Harrison Ford, right? Yeah, but that's so but, true. Yeah, but but you know the the actors playing Ishida and Sato are really amazing actors. Oh, and the guy who plays Tozawa, the scary, yes. fiercely, you know, uh, absolutely uh, terrifying, <laughs> you know, absolutely terrifying. <laughs> he, he is absolutely charming in public. He's just such yeah. a good. He's, but he's he's terrifying. <laughs> also, the 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 um, a man without enemies is no man at all. 
one of his signature lines in the trailer. That was actually yeah. Sekiguchi's line. I felt kind of like putting that in his mouth, was kind of like blasphemous, but I'm like, but you know. It works. Yeah, it kind of works. But, but there is also, yeah. uh, you know, a sort of machismo and a line of thought there that that is the same. Yeah, he is, his character, Totsawa as a character is absolutely terrifying, like absolutely terrifying. And he, again, like what I've ever seen he's in, it's just like, you're just completely enraptured. Um, and then obviously there's Ken Watanabe, who I adore. I've watched so many of his movies and he's absolutely fantastic. What was it like working with him? Um, Ken is just a very charming, wonderful person. There is, yeah. uh, there's, you know, I think it comes in the preview. There's, a, there's some very funny scenes where he's been, move to the organized crime consultation desk so basically he's <laughs> paranoid people who believe that you know that you know that they're being harassed by the yakuza when really they're probably just cuckoo crazy and those yeah. scenes are like, such like like you know such uh i i don't know what's the, what's the word for it? just such deadpan comedy so here's some some great moments in there as well <gasps> i can't wait to see it yeah i think the the japanese talent in this show is just extraordinary and there's some amazing acting talent coming out of Japan that I can't wait to hopefully see more of as well. Well, you know, what was unusual about the show and it was pointed out in the Japanese coverage of the show, which yeah. has been pre which has been very favorable, which made me very happy. That's good, is that, yeah. Is that, that we didn't pick, you know, we didn't allow the studios to push actors on us. We made everybody audition. And so, awesome. you know, we, we have really good actors and, and yeah. people that had really unknown to the general public before the show so it's been good yeah yeah it's amazing oh man i can't wait for season two <laughs> i just can't wait so what's upcoming for you jake so you have a book coming out soon tell us kind of everything that's going on you know are you are you taking a break or are you just gonna keep writing incredible books like what's what's on the so, horizon <laughs> so here is my here is my my forthcoming plan tokyo noir um yeah. In and out of the Japanese underworld, which is the 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 actual sequel to Tokyo Vice, is coming out this summer. Um, I am debating on what my next book will be. I actually have a meeting with my publishers next week to talk about it. I always publish everything in France with Marcia Lee first because uh, we have been friends since they started their publishing company. Yeah. Um, and I am currently working on a podcast about called Night Shift about um, a, a series of deaths at the Harry S. Truman's Hospital where my father worked in 1992, um, where it appeared that one nurse named Rich Williams killed 40 patients. Um, oh and my gosh. father was one of the people that called in the FBI or tried to call in the FBI while the administration tried to cover it up. And so uh, me and Shoko or going to Missouri for a month. We've set up most of our interviews and we're going to take a look back at what may have been one of the biggest serial killings by a nurse in the United States and why That's the investigation insane. went crazy and the high cost for the people who actually try, stood up and tried to stop the nurse from killing people. That's um, insane. Uh, and what is even more insane is that the nurse was never convicted. <sighs> what <laughs> i'm giving away a lot of this but uh that is what i'm working on next so okay that's what, and, and then okay. after we finish that i don't know what my next book will be but i i am i'm committed to doing my zen buddhist duties and grading up by yeah. the end of the year yeah. i'm gonna take it easy from july till december that's good i feel like you're probably one of those people who says they're gonna take it easy but then you'll have another idea for a book <laughs> just start writing it <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah well at least, at least have a plan i have a plan right? yeah that's true that's true um yeah, no, thank you tokyo vice tokyo vice money so i can afford to do that from yeah exa exactly exactly and hopefully it keeps coming in as well um look jake thank you so much for your time this was absolutely incredible i think a lot of people are going to learn a lot i definitely did um i'm very excited to watch season two of Tokyo Vice so definitely if you're in the US go watch that on I think it's February the 8th right on HBO Max right and then and go ahead if you absolutely you know can't wait are you just like I love this vibe um listen to The Evaporated um Gone with the exactly. Gods wherever you get your podcast that's exactly. still up and when's the last Yakuza coming out 
So the last Yakuza has been published in England on the 1st of February. Okay, perfect. Tokyo Noir will be published in Australia first because Scribe is an Australian company. Then yeah. in July in, in Great Britain and the UK. And then uh, in the United States in October. Back in the light. <laughs> publishing timelines are so weird i will also put all your information into the description also your twitter which i strongly recommend following because i always learn something new when having you tweet something <laughs> thank you and uh, i really appreciate the time and thank you so much thank you so I, I, I can't wait to see that okay yeah perfect take care Bye. Thank you.